I don't get it. Why he's always late. All right. Well, you are almost half an hour early. All right. And I had it as one o'clock in my phone. <laughs> All right, folks, let's get this august group of outstanding individuals together and organized here. <clears throat> I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, hold on. First, I'd like to um, establish the voting members. All of the alternates can vote uh, that are here today. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, let me start off with the um, purpose statement for the Citizens Advisory Committee. The primary objective of the CAC is to ensure the capital maintenance and public transportation projects and programs approved by the voters at the September, November 2nd, 2004, November 6th, 2012, and November 7th, 2017 ballot measures are accomplished with RTA funds. This committee reports to the PPRTA Board of Directors. So now everybody's all the wiser. Oops, sorry. Um, item number two, approval of the agenda. Do I hear a motion, Tom? Tom approves. I hear a second. Joan, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Um, public comment period for anything not on the agenda. Anybody have anything they want to uh, bring up from committee standpoint? Ann? Um I was at the Board of Trustees meeting last night in Green Mountain Falls, and they're still having trouble getting all their roads back in order. Uh, there's been some money from the PPRTA, which is greatly appreciated. Um, one concern was, and I'm, I'm assuming this is between the town and the person who has the contract, Belvedere Road, uh, there was this... <laughs> citizen last night that was very upset because their driveways aren't meeting the road <laughs> and uh, they still have some money to spend uh, but that's just been a big concern in Green Mountain Falls and then um, I'd just like to mention too you know that I sent out an email today even though I, I certainly approve of what Brian is doing with the buses and all but I'm really concerned that the mountains are forgotten and since I'm from Green Mountain Falls, that's what I think about, and I'm up there. So I just thought I would bring that up. If, if rules can ever be changed so that it gets a little more rural, I think we'd appreciate that. Thank okay. you. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, any disagreement between the contractor and the municipality is between them. So, okay. Uh, any public comments from members of the audience seeing none we'll move on item number four approval of minutes of the June 5 meeting do I hear a motion to approve and we have a second Tony thank you uh, all those in favor say aye aye, aye. any opposed thank you miss Bev so we have a different obstacle course to run today Ah, good afternoon. So for the April sales and use tax, we received almost 9100000 So we were $1.2 ahead of the monthly budget. So now we are 3188000 ahead of the year-to-date budget. But um, some of this is due to the fact that we're keeping the budget kind of flat at uh, $100 million, so that's some of it. And then on page two, you can see how we're doing against last year's actual. So it's not quite as good as the first page because that's just comparing year to year. But even so, April was a big plus of 10.22% higher than the last April. Um, I don't know that I expect this to continue because um, last year we had the big hailstorms and there were a lot of new car purchases and so on, which are reflected in last year's numbers. And hopefully, I mean, we won't have another hailstorm like that this year. It would be nice to get a break. But uh, we'll kind of see these numbers in comparison go down then, which, you know, it's just part of it. 
So then the f next pages are just the regular financial statements and then all the capital projects that are um, from the beginning inception to date. So does anybody have any questions about the financial statements? Anybody? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Item number six, uh, capital maintenance and public transportation, uh, 6A Colorado Springs. Mike? Good afternoon. Mike Chavez, City Engineering. Uh, give me a second here. I kind of made a mess of my pile. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so we have a few items to uh, ha have you review and hopefully get a positive recommendation of the board. So the first uh, item is a construction contract for Lawrence construction, Lawrence construction for the uh, construction of the bridge uh, on the Mark Sheffel alignment over Sand Creek. We did an RFP and had to negotiate. We negotiated to get the the price down, so um, we have enough money. Yeah, left over in RTA one in the actual Mark Shuffle account, and then we've got some developer money uh, and CSU money uh, also being contributed. That's the ninety thousand that you see there. So the three point nine is going to come out of RTA one. Yes. The next. Uh, any question? Uh, I'm looking at the map that's accompanying this, it looks like the other side of the creek is prairie land. Is there a road plan for their near term? Uh, yes. Now we're n we're not looking at funding that. I mean, right now we're we're finished with RTA money. We are looking at seeing what we can do. Uh, you know, get. I think the idea was is we built the bridge. Hopefully, the developers will come in and be able to connect the roads to it. Say, Cheryl? Well, there's a lot of growth. I think it's going <laughs> to, they, they need to do that. Um, okay. Build, uh, it, build it and they will come. At least the corn poppers. Okay, any other? All right. Uh, next time we have is. Um, a change order for AECOM for the Sierra Madre uh, street reconstruction. <coughs> and uh, what this is is a um, change order to uh, cover some uh, additional final design elements that they had as they were finishing up. And then we're adding the construction management portion to their contract. And this, um, this $1.2 million from the RTAs part of the, that uh, funding that's been approved. Uh, the, right now where we stand, there's $7.6 million of RTA money for the Southwest, or for the Sierra Madre and Vermont Hall Street reconstruction. And so this 1.2 is coming out of that, that uh, bucket of money. Uh, next item we have is um, a change order for Wildcat construction. We're kind of we're getting close to being finished with that. They're actually striping uh, the the western section from Union Union Boulevard West, west and that'll be open today. Um, so as we're f kind of finishing up, uh, we what what we have is that there's um, several overruns that are in the memo that are are discussed, some additional costs, and that's what um, that one point eight one point one million comes from. This explaining the memo. Uh, but we are still under the budget that we have for that project, so we're, we're okay with that. And this is going to kind of be, uh, we might have a little bit another change order, but it shouldn't be too much, if, if at all. Mike, could you explain the second paragraph that was um, exceeding, it has to do with policy number 12? Oh, yeah, okay. So um, policy so anything, any change order uh, over 20000 uh needs to come to the board, but on the large project, we ask for an exemption. 
where we uh, could issue task orders up to $100,000 without coming to the board uh, up to either, depending on the project, either 5 or 10% of the total project. So uh, the change orders that have been coming to us have been under 100000 but since this one's over 100000 it needs to come to the CAC and board for approval. Thank you. Uh, the next item is a... Uh, one other question, please. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. On the back, under dewatering, you've got a couple of acronyms in there. L oh. L U S T and uh, so the lust is a uh, is basically a contaminated gas uh, uh, leaking underground storage tank. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, and what's the C D P A G? Colorado Department of Public Health and, and Environment. Environment. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next item, we have a final design or a design contract for Wilson and Company to design the bridge uh, replacement of air. Uh, Airport Road or Spring Creek. They did a preliminary work, and then this is uh, uh, for them to uh, continue on with that design. Mm -hmm. The uh, Airport Road was basically from Shelton East to Academy. It was redone last year. When I say it redone, they hired you, a contractor, and you built sidewalk and encroached on some apartments to the south at Shelton, mm -hmm. and they went all the way down on the north side. The bridge was never touched, and I literally saw Schwertberger doing pipe, and I stopped and asked about it, and I asked uh, somebody here, it might have been you, they're putting in some cast iron valves and whatnot, they were done, then the city came in and did a, and I stand to be corrected, Corey. I don't know whether you did a total milling and overlay or not, but you went literally from Shelton all the way to Academy. And I saw the bridge wasn't complete. When I say that, you, the people that were building the sidewalk, went down and partway across the, the end of the golf course, and then the, side, the sidewalk stopped. I don't know where the hell you're supposed to go from there because you, there's not really room enough. Why wasn't it done prior to... Well, actually, that was uh, the missing sidewalk program, and the intent there was is to try to get pedestrian access from Academy West all the way, but uh, the bridge is not wide enough to accommodate sidewalk, sidewalk. But it's all, but it's a project we knew about. So our missing sidewalk program, what they did is basically um, they went from um, Circle to Chelton because that was a missing piece on the on the south side. Well, we did the north side a few years ago. And then we went east of yeah. Chowton just as far as we practically could. Um, there is a little bit of sidewalk on the uh, s the north side of the bridge over airport, but it's not wide enough. It's you know it's not ADA compliant. So basically, we 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 came as far as we could uh, from Chowton, and with the intent that when the bridge is widened, we make the finish the connection. We can do everything all at once. So uh, uh, and so well, you know, there's a lot of foot traffic from from Chelton to Circle. So we thought you know, it would be beneficial for the pedestrians to make those connections. And we'll finish up this last one when the, with the bridge. How's that going to affect the fire station, the new fire station there, airport and again? I don't think it will. I mean, we'll work with it. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, we haven't designed it, but I'm sure we'll make sure they're aware of what we're doing. Oh, yeah, Carl. Uh, yes, Mike, um, just going back to the um, Spring Creek Bridge. Mm -hmm. um, do you have the estimate on the construction costs for this? This is the design, 437000 for just finishing up the design, correct? Um, yeah, I believe we have a, an estimate. Um, now it's about it's around $4 million. Four million. And I, and I, I'm not sure if that's the whole project or the bridge. I, I think the pro Yeah, uh, that would seem reasonable. I always the whole project is about $4 million. Yeah, I'm just um, reviewing just to, it says 2.8 million for the current budget right now in our capital expenditures report. Mm -hmm. So we're going to need to put in another uh, $2 million into that. Yes, so and, I, and I kind of anticipated that uh, when I talked last month about finishing the A-list in my report. 
I've taken a few projects where we have a better idea of where we really think those numbers are, and uh, this this project, I think I've I've got plans to supplement that. Plans to increase the budget yes, for in, that. Okay. In 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 uh, 2020. Very good. That answered my question. Thank you, Jane. When do you expect to start work on the bridge? Oh, you would ask me that. Um, <laughs> probably 2020. I mean, we'll we'll finish up design this year and start in 2020. Any other up to that point? Next, Mike. Then the last item is we've got uh, a change order to add construction money to all cats construction contract for Sierra Madre and Vermajo. We're adding um, 1.9 million of RTA funds and then 10 million dollars from other funds, which is the URA and the developer money. Uh, again, that 1.9 is coming out of that um, 7.6 million pot that we have. Oh, okay. I apologize. Yeah, I forgot to put that one on. I gave it. So it's a, this is a walk-on one. That uh, did you give it out? Yes. Okay. So that was one I uh, I missed. So uh, gave it to Rick yesterday. To, to save you, maybe I'm slower than the average snail, but um, it took me about 20 minutes to try to sort out. One was change order one. One was change order three. But one was engineering services and the other one was construction. So um, the numbers didn't correlate. So it save you some time. Circle the operation, the construction and engineering lines. Any other questions for Mike on red? I'd like to go back to uh, Pike's what, mm -hmm. what to walk on? It was an, a change, a revised. It wasn't on the original list. Oh. So he brought in. A East Pike Peak. Mm -hmm. What are the uh, problems between Printers Parkway and actually it's just east of the Union intersection? They dug it out several times. They actually had some geotextile in, and they've been hand digging some. They, that's water boxes. Mm -hmm valve boxes, but they've also virtually hand dug. They're no bigger than a bobcat, and they're going quite deep into some very black dirt. Yeah, I, just I believe what's going on there is um, <laughs> there's a business that we asked them to shut off their irrigation system, and they said they have, but we don't think they have, and I think it keeps saturating the soil. But they're digging out. They've dug out in places up to four I'll places. have to find out for you. I know I was talking to Ryan, and he would just tell me kind of the status, and he did mention that they were having you know issues. Every time they get ready to try to finish up, it gets flooded. But uh, if there's something else, I'll, I'll see if there's anything else okay. going on. I'm just curious. Well, they didn't put the geotextile on. It's now sitting on the, side, on the sidewalk with a bunch of safety cones. And just for safety, I just drove through there this morning, and it's posted 30 miles per hour. And now on orange diagonals, right in front of the 30 mile an hour sign, is a 25 mile hour zone. I don't know. I drive 20 through there, and if you want to stop me for speeding, I ain't going to get a double fine. I'm going to fight. But it was really confusing. If you're driving through there, what's your speed limit? Suppose oh, I'll, I'll look at that. Was the 30 the white, the white sign? The white sign is the 30. Okay, and so we and got a, so we got a construction. Sign. Okay, so we probably should have. Maybe covered up the white one or taking it out. Any other? Oh, and and you, you got are any other questions? Okay. All right. And no. Oh, oh. Tony. This isn't a question. I was gonna. Make oh, a motion, go, if that's yeah, go, go. I'd like to move for approval of uh, City of Colorado Springs items one through five. Second. Joan. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Is this intentional to trap us back? Here? Yeah. <laughs> it, it was. It, Make it run the gauntlet. It was re. It was rearranged so that you could have close coordination. Oh. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, 
rest of the com commission or committee, Jennifer Irvin, County Engineer. We have two items on the agenda today for your uh, recommendation. And uh, these are items that I spoke about last month in my briefing and said I would be bringing them forward to you. Um, so the first one is our South Academy Boulevard and getting that project underway into design. And um, this is for an initial contract with AECOM for about $1.5 million. Um, essentially what they are going to be doing is starting the project and this will get us up into uh, preliminary design phase, uh, pretty far into preliminary design, about 60%. And so when we move forward with this project, we will be coming to you, back to you, um, with future design um, monies for uh, completing the design. The reason why we broke it out into preliminary design and final design is that this uh, area of South Academy has several bridges and we need to do an assessment on those bridges um, prior to finishing up the final design and, and um, if we were to ask AECOM for a final design number for that without them doing some preliminary work it would be very very large and I would rather not do that. <laughs> so. Um, this keeps them within the preliminary design and as we get further along we'll be coming back to you. Um, as you are aware, last month uh, we talked about uh, uh, working on a build grant uh, re related to this project and that is moving along and we do expect that to be submitted on uh, July 15th in coordination with CDOT. The second contract uh, also spoke about with you last month was is for final design for Highway 105. Uh, we had um, completed uh, an initial corridor study with Road and Bridge money before County Road and Bridge money before the the PPRT extension, and that had identified all of uh, uh, high level improvements. Uh, we moved forward into preliminary design for the entire corridor um, around 2000. Um, uh, 15 and uh, are still completing final design on the first phase which is Woodmore to Lake Woodmore and uh, we feel like we're ready to go ahead and start the next phase and get that underway and uh, we are um, it is labeled as phase B through E on your memo but um, that's how it was identified in the original corridor study but essentially we are completing going to um, uh, final design about 90 percent final design um, for that corridor and it's about four miles worth of, of roadway so um, that uh, will be uh, approximately eight hundred sixty thousand um, dollars we will be coming back to you with a, a final you know package at some point in the future because uh, we did not include right-of-way acquisition in that final package or anything else we want to get through the final design uh, pretty far into it the ninety percent level and then come back for that Tony, um, do you have an estimate on when the construction is actually going to start on that and how long that construction will take for the full four mile segment? No. Um, okay. <laughs> we, um, uh, we, we need to get into the final design and have a good idea of how much property acquisition is, is going to be needed. You know, as you are aware, there's a lot of rural um, homes adjacent to that. and. Uh, uh, I think we need to get further into the design and, and feel a little bit more comfortable with that. Um, we do are we're moving forward with the final design so that we can go ahead and get the project moved forward as quickly as possible. Um, Brian was first, and then Jean. Uh, uh, Jennifer, actually, it ties real right in with what uh, kind of what you were saying in answer to Tony. Um, I've been made aware of a small but vocal. Uh, number of people who live in this area who um, as happens a lot of times uh, are not real happy with the idea of expanding traffic flow through there um, I, I tried to say look this is a major east-west and unfortunately with all the growth blah 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 it's got to happen um, to what extent are you able to kind of address those questions early with with these folks and maybe allay some of their fears and hopefully get their buy-in because that could complicate some of your um, uh, property acquisition yeah so um, 
If you want to pass those along to me and forward those to me, that would be great. Um, okay. We did do with the corridor study a significant public outreach and had, I think, two to three meetings on this corridor. But, you know, that was done in 2012 and 2013. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're happy to sit down and talk to them. If, if they have an HOA, it's a little bit easier. If there's individuals, you know, when we typically what we do is we get through kind of the final design and then talk to those individually you know if they do have impacts now if, if they just have a concern about the overall traffic then then you know we can meet with them earlier on um, we try and do as much outreach as possible but if you are hearing from a specific uh, uh, residences or, or people just forward those along to me and we'll try and uh, meet with them and and at least alleviate some of their concerns yeah. unfortunately they're right beside a major roadway in unincorporated El Paso County and um, uh, there's not many other options. Well, it's it's a very important east-west connection between mm -hmm. the the highway and uh, Highway 83 and, and and 25. So, and I said I said look, you know, work with the folks at the county and wait until they actually start getting the design done before you start pitching a fit. Either way, just forward them to me. We'll take care of it. Thanks, Gene. Uh, Gene first, please, Larry. On the South Academy project, your drawing shows South Academy going over 25, and that's not the way it is currently. Is that <laughs> a proposed change to the? No, it's not going over. Just trying to depict the the extents of it. It it's it's not supposed to. It's it's just brought to the front so you could see the extents of South Academy. So no, um, the bridges over South Academy are are will remain over South Academy. Okay. One other question. Do you know if CDOT is going to do any work on the merge lane coming off of South Academy, southbound on 25? That's something that we'll have to look at with uh, the, the this uh, overall grant application that we're working on with them. Either way, um, as I mentioned to you last month, either way, irrespective of whether the build grant goes forward or not, um, because we have funding for South Academy and CDOT will have funding for replacing those bridges. We're anticipating moving forward uh, with with working with CDOT on that area. Um, we do intend to take a look at that. Um, specifically, uh, Academy Boulevard, as you come out off of I-25, has two lanes, and that's one of the things that we'll be look adding that's part of the purpose of this project is three lanes. So as a result, we have to look at that that ramp and and the other part of that is that we have some drainage issues on that shoulder that really need some attention as well a northbound exiting on the south academy is always a pain uh, the problem going southbound on 25 is short sight lines and a lot of traffic yep so thank you um, larry and then carlos <laughs> on the 105 project um the as you say, you're going to have to do a lot of property acquisition pretty much through the whole corridor, which will move the expansion of the road closer to houses on both sides of the road. Um, as part of the study and design, are you also doing a um, noise study and evaluating whether you're going to have to put noise walls uh, throughout that parts of that corridor? So we actually did a noise study with the corridor study just to kind of get a good handle on that. At that point, we did not have um, the, the rates that would raise to the level of, of putting in noise barriers. Um, but um, I think we're, we're going to need to update that study since it's a little bit old um, and take a look at that. But um, what typically happens just in general is that, you know, when you have a lot of rural area, there's... There's uh, certain calculations that we have to do to determine whether a noise wall is, uh, is it's a really a benefit to cost ratio. And then, and then on top of it, then you have to, even if you hit that benefit to cost, which is very difficult in a rural area, then you have to um, determine whether those residents want that. So um, I, we did do a study, we'll be updating it, and we'll be taking a look at that with the final design. Carla. Yeah, returning back to the uh, the South Academy project, um, looks like with the project limits there, it's going over the um, Fountain Creek Regional Trail. Um, you know, I assume, of course, that you're working with the El Paso County Parks and the, does this design contract also, are they including some uh, work to 
look at that as well, the trail connection or, or a trail, I should say, that goes under, um, under Academy there? Um, so, yes, in, in a simple, um, so just so that you're aware, um, uh, although El Paso County Parks is not <laughs> under Department of Public Works, we actually do all of their engineering for them. So uh, we, are, we are highly aware of, uh, you know, that crossing. So uh, we are working and looking at additional opportunities for pedestrian access along this corridor, um, specifically in relationship to that uh, crossing, but also adjacent to the corridor. So that is a scope of work that's in the, the design contract. Uh, we do have a pedestrian bridge that crosses South Academy, um, just um, east of um, I-25, and so we want to make sure that not only are we coordinating with uh, pedestrian access, but looking at multimodal as well, because Mountain Metro Transit runs that road, and as does uh, the City of Fountain Transit. So, Mr. Chair, I'd move approval. Um, we have a motion to approve. Second. Uh, second. <laughs> Pick one. Uh, Brian. Sorry, you should have announced. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Uh, City of Manitou Springs. Right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, committee members. Uh, I'm Jeff Jones. I'm the new Deputy Public Services Director. Been in that position about a week, so I'm new to this project, so bear with me and we'll go over it. Well, I uh, worked for Shelley. Shelley decided it was a good idea to go to a Santana concert, enjoy some good, <laughs> enjoy some good beverages, and I think she was right. <laughs> We're not that bad. No, you're fine. Trust me. It's been a lot worse. So the project I'll talk about is the... Uh, <laughs> the Ruxton Creek Box Tunnel Drainage uh, Project. Uh, the original allocation for this project was 200K, but we have from our uh, subcontractor, Agave Masonry, a contract bid that came in at $76,262, <clears throat> which is significantly less. Uh, the location is in the Ruxton Manitou Road turnabout. Uh, there on the main drag, it is... Uh, to restore and preserve the masonry walls located in the tunnel itself. Uh, the work involves rebuilding and stabilizing sections of the wall where needed and setting new stones at the base of the wall inside the creek. Uh, and they are estimated that this uh, work will take approximately five weeks to accomplish. It's a small project, but it's certainly a much needed project for the safety of the citizens of Manitou Springs. Heavy travel road uh, there, very lovely area. Yeah, we're looking for approval on that. Like I said, it came, the original bid was 20k, and we come in at 76,000 from a Galway masonry we've used many times before. Tony, that, I'll take some questions. Tony, Hi. sir. So, um, is this an area that was like uh, damaged pretty significantly by the floods a couple it, of years back? From my understanding, like I said, I've been here one week. So, oh. from my understanding, is that it did have damage from the floods because of the heavy water that obviously was flowing through there. Right. It came off the mountain pretty heavy as it flowed, so it, it damaged some of the stones on the underside of the undertow of the bridge there, and that's where we're going to reinforce it. Sure. More stone and more concrete work. Okay. And uh, is there any talk about uh, what types of materials are going to be using to try to prevent future flooding incidents from actually breaking it apart? I think uh, what they had, when we had talked to uh, the gentleman from Agave Masonry, they're going to use some diversion uh, masonry ridges. In other words... It's going to hit, drive the water out, hit again, drive the water out to the center. It'll keep away from the base of the, of the bridge. It'll so keep from the erosion from taking place. That's the one that goes under there and comes out on the west side of the street but by the building? Actually on the east side. East side, okay. Yeah. It comes from the west side off the mountains, come out on the east side down by the parks right. and all that down through there. We have a motion to approve. Any second? Tony Joy, a second. Jean, Jean, Bray, and Tony. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 And, oh, David, sorry. That's between 
It's between Manitou and the contract. Well, we have the contract. It's approved by the city council. We're just looking for the funding to pay the contract. Well, because this all says, this is, this is a contract between contractor consulting the city and the three-way contract. Yeah, three-way contract. All of our contract would be that. So the question was, the RTA being party to the contract, Rick's answer was, it's a three-way uh, between the contract and the city and the RTA. Quick, uh, quick question. If yes, if you know, uh, what's the the age of the original structure? That is uh, a very good question. Let me get smart on that, and I'll get you an answer next time. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I know it's not new. I'll I know it's that. not new. I was going to say. I'll get an answer on that. I've only went down there once before I came to the meeting, just a little real quick. Yeah, <laughs> it's more than a week. Yeah. Well, I've done this before, but only a week here. <laughs> just more, more of a curiosity. <laughs> but, All right, uh, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item seven A, uh, member of government's other reports, uh, transit monthly report. Welcome, Brian. Seven A. Good afternoon, Brian Vitoli with the City of Colorado Springs Mountain Metro Transit, with your monthly transit report. Uh, for May of 2019, we carried uh, nearly 285,000 customers on our fixed route service, and that was uh, up 5.4 percent over May of 2018. So we're continuing on a good trend, um, other than March of this year. Um, January, well, actually, we're on a good trend these last couple months, <laughs> so we hope to continue that. I think overall we're, we're up over, over uh, this time last year, which is another good sign. Uh, for our ADA paratransit service, um, we saw a decrease of a little over 7% for that same time period. And for our van pool services, we operated 25 van pools uh, this past May. And uh, that was a decrease of 6.7% over May of 2018. Uh, project update, we're ready to go to public meetings next week. We have uh, two public meetings next Tuesday. Uh, the first at City Hall at 9 a.m. and then the second at noon at Library 21C. And then on Wednesday we'll be at Pikes Peak Community College's uh, Centennial Campus from 5.30 to 6.30. And um, following my report um, at last month's meeting, um, we, we decided to defer our fare changes until uh, probably this time next year. Um, we're looking to, to go to the public in January for our, our regular spring service change public process. And whatever fare changes are recommended to implement, we'll implement most likely in June or July of 2020. A couple reasons for this. Um, with all of our service changes, we there's a threshold that requires us to perform a Title Title VI analysis, which is making sure that the services we provide and where we provide them doesn't benefit but benefit one one neighborhood or one one group of people over the other. Um, and for for this fall service change, you know, we're adding off-peak service on. Uh, Saturday evenings and increasing frequencies on Sunday, that was below that, I believe, 30% change threshold. But since we were proposing to do fare changes, that automatically requ requires us to do a Title VI analysis. And for fare changes, it's pretty involved, um, and we realize that um, we have a fairly current onboard survey from 2017, but we thought it better to... Uh, update that with fresh data. So we're, we're going through now and performing, uh, or getting ready to perform an onboard survey uh, on throughout our system, you know, and asking some of those questions, um, you know, how do they pay, how do they pay? Do they use their smartphone? Um, you know, is it something that we could, we could um, use in the Title VI analysis to help us with our fair change proposal? Um, so, there were a couple things there, and, and another thing it gives, um, you know, the word is out now, it, it will give our customers more time to adjust their budgets or um, prepare for whatever fare changes come um, this time next year. 
So we're just moving moving ahead um, next month, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, with our public meetings for adding um, Saturday evening service on 13 routes and increasing frequency on our five highest ridership routes on Sunday. Uh, are there any questions? Tony? Brian, it looks like it was a pretty significant drop in ridership uh, year over year on the ADA um, transit. Do you have any ideas why there would have been that drop off or was that potentially because of the policy change on ADA versus fixed route? Well, um, you know, you can see, yeah, with the exception of, of April, April was up. Um, ADA has kind of always had that up and down um, ridership trend. And what we did see, though, um, getting to your point, we, we have seen a decrease in ADA ridership overall from, uh, we think it could be tied to the, the impact of the, the fair or the, uh, the policy change that we made on uh, last fall, I believe, for our ADA system. And that was um, requiring those who are cer certified for ADA paratransit service. Previously, they could ride our fixed route service for free. Um, we, we added um, a policy change to require them to pay uh, a half fare. So they're paying 85 cents, which, which is half of the, the full fare. Um, you know, we, we did see a little bit, of, uh, little bit of misuse on that. And so whether it's, whether it's just a general up and down trend or an impact of that, you know, it could be a little, little, little both of that. Um, but we generally, you know, with, with the higher cost of ADA power transit service, um, it's not necessarily a bad thing to see the ADA ridership go down. That means, you know, whether it's correlated with some of the increases in our fixed route service, it, there could be some of that. But, um, you know, if, if, if our customers are able-bodied enough to ride um, our fixed route service, that's what we would encourage because it's a, a less expensive service to provide. Uh, Brian, if I could ask you to um, expand a little bit on misuse. Well, um, so when the word gets out that Mountain Metro is giving away free fixed route bus passes, mm -hmm. when they come to our customer service window and say, I'm here for my free bus pass, that kind of tipped us off a little bit. <laughs> that, um, that, you know, there, there were ways for people to come in if they were ADA Power Transit certified and get that free fixed route um, ability to ride our fixed route service for free. And, and we did a lot of um, data analysis and, you know, it, we, we did see that some, some of the numbers of, the, the number of people who were certified for paratransit, um, you know, we can tell when they're using paratransit or a fixed route system. Um, you know, there were a large number of them who were using the ADA paratransit system very infrequently mm -hmm. and using the fixed route service very frequently for free. So we, we kind of um, kind of also did a peer analysis, peer review of some of our, uh, you know, transit properties that are similar to, to us and, and many of them um, required those types of passengers to, to pay at least something on the fixed route system. Well, I, th I think it's good that you were actually able to, to, to mm -hmm. track that crossover um, and come and develop a, uh, uh, a strategy moving mm -hmm. forward to not only be able to provide the service but also prevent the abuse. Right. So right. I think that's good. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, we, we did get, of course, it wasn't a popular thing to go to our public meetings uh, proposing, but, you know, we did actually get some of our customers who said, uh, you know, I understand, and, you know, we should be paying for at least something uh, for the service provided to us. So, um, so it, it was a good a good uh, rollout of that. And again, we kind of like what we're proposing with this fair proposal coming up. Um, there was a, enough notice to those customers that this policy change was coming, and they had they had a chance to adapt and get ready for it. Okay. Anything else? Uh, no. Um, I just wanted to let you know that I did. Um, 
I did email Rick this morning a, uh, an email that will most likely be coming out to you, and I think I talked to you about it last month or two months ago. Um, we just did kick off our 2045 regional transit plan and our specialized transportation coordination plan, so that's a, a joint planning process uh, with PPACG. They're doing a specialized plan, and we're doing a tran the transit plan, um, but also our North Nevada transit corridor analysis. Um, so we're going to be looking for... This was kind of a formal ask um, of you all to kind of think about who you would like to um, identify to be on our stakeholder uh, committee. And what we're looking for is probably two people, like a primary and an alternate. What, what we would like to make sure that we have is um, for those two or three stakeholder meetings and those two or three public meetings, um, just to make sure that we have a representative from the CAC, whether it's the primary or the alternate. So um, you can discuss that as you will and, um, and just, just let me know. But we're starting to try to get that stakeholder group list identified and formalized. I'm glad you brought it up because I did have a quick question on that. I, I read that email and I didn't. And it said that you're looking to identify, but it didn't have anything in there on who to contact or how you want us to self-identify if we're interested. We'll work that as a committee okay. um, versus just inundating with 25 people. And okay. So we'll work that as a committee as a formal rep from the RTA. And then you can just pass that on to me. We can, I mean, if there's enough interest, did everybody get a chance to read the email? Yeah. No. I haven't read any email for four weeks. Well, that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I also did the same for the city's uh, Citizens Transportation Advisory Board and our Transit Passenger Advisory Committee. So we're just looking to get some representation from, from those groups. Brian, should we get that to you before next month's meeting or? That would be great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That would be great. Um, so let's just take a moment. Is is show of hands of someone that might be interested in serving on one of these plans? Okay, um, I've served on them in the past uh, for the 2040 plan. Uh, it's very good. It's a um, um, moderated process. Uh, works very very well. So um, why don't Tony, Rev, and I get together after the meeting and we'll we'll iron it out and as for primary and all to that that's satisfactory with everybody. Okay, great. Thank you. And, and you're all welcome to come to the public meetings. So there's there's no no cap on who we would like to come to those. Um, and usually the more the better. All right. Any other questions for Brian? Thank you, Brian. Okay. Thank you. Uh, member of governments, uh, item 7B, Colorado Springs update on Rock Rimmon project. Is that going to be you, Mr. Corey? Sure. I object. you got quite a mess up there. <laughs> okay, good afternoon. Corey Farkas, uh, City of Colorado Springs Public Works. Uh, so a couple of months ago, we came to the CAC and then the PPRTA board uh, for a uh, uh, the contract to do a partial reconstruct on South Rock Rimmon, uh, upwards of five and a half million dollars thereabouts. Uh, so we figured uh, we'd come to you uh, monthly and give you an informational update, just kind of uh, where we're at on the project and, and how everything's going. Uh, so uh, current work area, uh, at this point in time, uh, this particular project is running from Vindicator uh, down to uh, Pro Rodeo. We will be doing additional work uh, when this part of the project is, is complete. Uh, on the east side of Pro Rodeo, uh, between Pro Rodeo and I-25, uh, however, traffic engineering does have uh, some coordination to do with, uh, with CDOT because of the CDOT property um, right away uh, through there. And there are some curb lines that need to uh, move. We're going to be uh, kind of realigning some of those lanes so that we can remove that trap left and some of the issues uh, that cause accidents in that area. But because of the uh, coordination with CDOT, we figured we'd go ahead and get started with this uh, portion of the project and try to get uh, get it out of the way. So Vindicator to, uh, to Pro Rodeo uh, in both directions. Um, so we're working on the, uh, if you will, north side of the, uh, of the road right now. Um, Mother Nature has forced us to uh, change our plans just a little bit. Um, means and methods are up to the contractor. 
Uh, however, we can uh, gently, uh, gently <laughs> persuade them uh, through uh, uh, different means. It's usually coal. Uh, letting them know on a weekly basis if they don't hit this date by October 31st uh, that there will be liquidated damages assessed. Uh, but uh, initially we were going to be working on the concrete on the north side of the road uh, from west to east, then flipping it and coming uh, east to west uh, back up the other side. Uh, with the summer that we've had thus far and the uh, wet weather and everything, we, uh, Schmidt has changed their plans just slightly. Uh, they are doing both the concrete uh, curb and gutter sidewalk and the roadway uh, on that north side of the road at this point in time uh, that is going to allow us we did add a uh, an under drain underneath the uh, toe of the gutter pan there to, to account for some uh, uh, some groundwater in the area um, so that'll uh, allow us to get that in uh, on that north side up there so um, here you see them digging out uh, digging out that curb and gutter on uh, on that north side uh, put in that curb gutter uh, and uh, and sidewalk back in, getting the subgrade in, getting the compaction done uh, on that, and then getting that curb and gutter in. Uh, and this includes on any of the cross streets coming in. Uh, this includes obviously all of the pedestrian ramps uh, that need to go in. Uh, as well, we have been uh, coordinating with traffic engineering uh, on fence posts. There will be a traffic signal that will be installed at fence posts. They've got some sight distance issues there. Uh, they're on the crown of a hill. And, uh, and it uh, uh, goes downhill and, and to the left in, in, uh, when you're coming out of there and then to the right. So there are sight distance issues. We will be putting a, a traffic signal in there, and we're coordinating with them to get their, their infrastructure for that signal in while we're doing our work, our work at, over there. So uh, again, some of the, the sidewalk, um, some that may live over in the area may have noticed uh, that the contractor uh, ripped out a lot of this sidewalk that you actually see here and put it back in. Uh, our QC team is doing a fantastic job uh, out there making sure that the contractors are adhering to uh, ADA standards. And they had upwards of 600 feet of sidewalk that was out of specification on their cross slope. Uh, our QC team caught it, marked it, and the contractor had to remove and replace it on their dime uh, to make that. Uh, yeah, that was a, uh, an interesting conversation. Uh, Cole, Cole, Cole does a great job out in the field of uh, convincing them that they need to, to do it right. So, uh, so here's our schedule. Uh, the uh, progress based on uh, on contract duration. Uh, again, you're going to see uh, a difference here that uh, that Mother Nature has been making so far with the change of plans, uh, and that is in uh, doing the roadway and and concrete in conjunction with one another. They have been making up time uh, dramatically. Uh, again, this is a partial reconstruct, so they are taking not just the asphalt, but uh, upwards of 13 inches of the subgrade uh, out, and they're uh, bringing that back with uh, a composite section uh, to include the TX7 grid for stabilization. Uh, and that grid is going down, uh, the aggregate base course is going back on top, and they're getting that uh, compact, uh, compacted right now. Uh, we're hoping to get uh, get some pavement down maybe next week, starting next week, we should start start to see some asphalt uh, going back down on that roadway. Uh, but this is uh, based on the contract duration, uh, based on the work completed. So you can see that uh, based on the contract duration, we should be farther than we are. Um, again, uh, weather delays uh, had some, some to do with that, but uh, at this point in time, uh, we are still holding Schmidt uh, to the October 31st date. Uh, for completion on this project. Um, upcoming work uh, will remove existing soils and place aggregates on the north side of Rock Rimmon. We just talked about that. Um, remove and replace concrete items on the north side of Rock Rimmon between Vindicator and Fence Post. That is what we uh, caught with the, uh, uh, with the ADA issues and had them replace. Um, we also have Lucky Dog out there uh, doing some of the drainage. Uh, we've uh, put in a D10R inlet structure to uh, help get the stormwater where it needs to go, and they've tied that into uh, to the, the stormwater infrastructure. Uh, and then continuous ongoing work items, traffic control, uh, erosion control, public involvement, et cetera. Uh, traffic control, probably the most difficult out there. There's a lot of people that use that roadway. Um, we have it in one direction in each uh, way. There are a couple of new, new and older businesses out there um, and trying to get everybody to where they need to go uh, is difficult, but I think the contractor is doing a pretty good job. Typically, when there's, uh, when there's a complaint, uh, we've got that corrected within 24 hours. Um, so and I think that's it. So, again, quick, uh, quick update. We're going to come, 
come back monthly and just kind of give everybody an update as we go. Corey, you guys took out a lot of a lot of stuff under that road. I mean, I mean, it, it looked like to me you, you mentioned 13 inches. It looks like there was a couple of feet in there at the lowest level uh, in there that you dug out. So you basically rebuilding that whole lane. So the 13 inches is an average throughout. There are some yeah. areas where it was upwards of 24 inches yeah. uh, deep, and then there's some areas where it's not that deep. Uh, the 13 inches is an average throughout the entire. Summer. Okay. Yeah. It was. I've I've been through about four or five times in the last week through there and. Um, and th th uh, making good progress, so yep. good job. I, I'm sure Cole loves this, but I drive it to and from work every day, and typically call <laughs> him in the morning and in the afternoon. So, yeah, uh, yeah. yes, and and if you if you really want a good comparison, go check the other side of the road near those apartments up there, how everything's crumbling. And if you haven't been up in that area, that's what it looked like. Uh, people, you refer to it as a roller coaster road. So. Uh, Good job so far. Great job. Yeah, it was. Uh, this is one of those roads. It was not identified because of the extensive work uh, under 2C. Uh, you know, with uh, with engineering taking care of of uh, uh, Centennial and Pikes Peak being our worst roads, uh, our worst complained about roads in town. Uh, Rock Rimmon uh, then filled that role, uh, but we didn't have any plans. So uh, so uh, PPRTA's uh, afforded us that opportunity to take care of that roadway. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Gore. Cole and all you guys, thanks. It's good work. Um, 7C, um, monthly change order um, for the city. Any changes, uh, questions, or comments on the change order log for Mike? Okay, it's informational, so seeing none. Uh, same for the county. Any changes or questions for Jennifer on the county's change order? Seeing none, we move along. Uh, the staff field report. Um, Rick's got that in your in your in his plan here or in the packet. Uh, all the places that he's been. I've been with him on some of these, and it's an interesting day. Any questions for Rick? All right, let's go to eight A report on recent board actions. The memos in your packet. Are there any questions? Okay, I do have a comment. So, um, so if some of you have read that memo on where's the, my where is my packet my thingy thingy on the report of board actions, uh, you may have noticed that the board. Um, did not approve the Van Buren um, um, project. The um, the part that bothered me in having missed the board and then listened to the um, uh, report was that they did not approve the line item transfer of money into the project of 200k for uh, Van Buren, but they approved a couple 2.1 or something 3.2 million transfer out of that same fund back into that same pot of money for a different project. But the important thing that was brought up um, uh, from my viewpoint, and I'm not speaking for anyone else, is um, there is a feeling among the board that these pots and categories are less valuable than an A-listed project. And we're calling them um, undefined, nebulous, uh, all this kind of stuff. And while I've been quick to point out that we don't have enough visibility in some of these projects, um, and that I know there's some feeling among some folks that, that when it jumped to 18 or 13 projects or whatever in the new budget, that these um, they weren't getting enough scrutiny into these projects, but the underlying cause on some of this was the board wanted to move towards finishing up the A list so they could get to the B list for political reasons, so that we were telling the the citizens that we're doing what we told them we were going to do, um, and so that when PPRTA three comes up, that we've got a good story to tell. Um, first of all, we have a good story to tell. 
Um, the second thing is, is this was brought up by new, new commissioners and new council members. And so it troubles me that they're not aware of what's going on within these projects and how important they play in the overall scheme of things. So, uh, and then, so I've kind of gone back and done some analysis on these programs and this is where, this again is my opinion. Um, there's a lot of money wrapped up in these projects to the tune of 48, for almost $48 million, and yet we're moving money in for a, another couple hundred thousand dollar project, and we have no visibility of how they're going to spend this $48 million across these programs. Um, and so I could see where if I was new and I was looking at these things and seeing projects that had $15 million in it and yet you're moving money into it, what are you doing with the $15 million? Um, and so um, Carlos also noted he listened to it and he noticed some of the same things and voiced some concerns uh, about our visibility into these projects. So um, I want to throw it out to the committee that um, I personally think that it would be useful for us uh, and to the board to see what is being planned within these pots to use this money and highlight things that have been accomplished versus just sitting here with a lot of money. Um, again, we, we border on telling somebody what to do with their money, which is kind of the line we don't really want to cross, but at the same time, uh, the execution rate in these things is, is about 58% uh, of the available money in the pot, yet they we're moving more money into it. And, and it just, I spent a career in financial planning and budgeting and long-term fiscal planning, and if, you, if you've got 15, $50 million in a plan and you want to spend and you want to move more money into it, what do you plan on doing with what's already in there? And I think that would be wise given the tone of the conversation that I heard on the uh, board meeting and the recording. Um, I think it would be wise for us as an oversight committee to um, respectfully ask the city uh, to come forward with what are your plans, not just nebulous paragraphs in a budget, but give us a more, more granularity in what's in here and what you plan to do with it. Um, Mike got into a little bit of that at the board meeting in terms of laying out what they're going to do on the A-list items uh, on the major projects and when they were planning on finishing them. But some members of the board were leaning towards um, not allowing any more money to go into these pots at all until they finish the A-list and, and, and move to the B-list, which I think would is not necessarily a wise move, but we do have $47.8 million in here, and I think we need to kind of know what the plan is for that. So that's my input. I'll open it up for any other comment. Reb? I uh, was at that board meeting, and there were literally a new commissioner, a new council member, both of, uh, one of which has got quite a bit of experience with PPRTA. And I had a slightly different take. Literally, it wasn't the fact. The, the A list is well defined except for six program funds. Incidentally, I met with Travis Easton the following Monday for a little over an hour, or a little under an hour. The problem that I saw that they pointed out was the, the program funds weren't defined, when I say funds, weren't defined to not to a quantity or dollar figure, but they weren't even defined. And again, talking on a personal basis, I think the city needs that. But at the same time, we took, and yes, I have a personal interest. You used some street, various program funds to fund the Bermijo and Sierra Madre and they quote, rightfully can do it, but they were not listed as a single project. That particular project now has a price tag of about $49.5 million total, and they have funded it as much as possible with PPRTA funds, i.e. 
to industry standards, but they were program funds. They are not well defined. And literally, when you go to uh, item B or from the A to the B list, the same programs are there. So how do you know that you aren't taking money from an A list listed project? For example, right now the Academy to, well, I can take either one of them, Bijou to Fountain, it is. No, Bijou to Air Airport is listed on the A list. And then there's a fir one further south on South Academy. It's from Fountain to Milton Proby Parkway. They have reasons for why they're timing. And the average person doesn't understand that it's not only engineering, but sometimes it's property. You see property acquirement. I don't want to take the flexibility away from the city. And so my conversation with uh, Travis is he's actually looking into it. And I suggested getting an outside legal advice as well as from the city council or councilor on how to reword things for the ballot initiative for P PPRTA3. Basically, to know that we are planning, and literally they're doing an excellent job of, how do I say, they expand their base, and they're getting money from private developers, and in some cases, they have vested interest, I understand. But they are taking, like, uh, the county's, uh, she's not here, is she? She's, oh, she might be, back there in the corner. The, the county's working with CDOT and working with grants, and they're trying to increase their ability to work with the funds that they can get from PPRTA. They're leveraging their monies. And so I, well, if you ask me to sit down and say, I don't want to do it or see it done, I do like the way, but the way the commissioner and the council person, I got the impression that they were, hey, wait a minute, how do we know that this isn't a B list item because it's under the program? Because we have no division, uh, definition of what's on the A list in that program and what's on the B list. And it is mandatory that we finish all of the A list items for all of the entities before you start on any of the B. And yes, Mike gave an excellent report. He's got us finishing all of the A-list items by, I, I stand to be corrected, I think it was 2023 and at least 2024. It sounds great, but how do we know that some of that money then is then being siphoned off to some of these program funds? I, so my, my understanding is, from what you're saying is there's an impression by some that uh, this is essentially a slush fund just being... I didn't use that word. <laughs> no, I'm trying to boil it down. All right. All right. <laughs> so so the, the, phrase was used, the, the phrase was used that these projects have exceeded their budgetary authority in some cases uh, by 100% by or more. And... Um, looking at what was in what was the original plan for the budget and you go back to 2012 and look at what they're budgeting now right. um, they were treating it as a single line item with a single project and a dollar value when in fact it was funded annually it was never intended to have a cap on it it was a percentage of the allocation the city was making and so they're looking at this was what was in 2012 and this is what you spent what you got budgeted this year, so you've already spent three times what you did in the other one, so this program is finished. And and I think they're misinformed um, in terms of the intent and the, and the original planned scope of the projects in terms of the work, um, intersection work and, and the things that they're, if, if they were trying to go and scope every single intersection project and make it an individual A-list project, um, this allows them flexibility to address things and do things, uh, and they fund it in their budget annually as we go along. And so I think there was just a little misunderstanding, but there was some skepticism too. Again, that's my read as I hear the words, and I've listened to it one and a half times. So um, I just I think that um, we need to 
inform um, and, and let people know what the original intent, what the dollar is, and the way for that to, to happen in my book is for us to get a little smarter on a little level, of, a little bit more granularity into those programs about the kind of work you've already done what is it you're planning on spending fifteen million dollars for in in the traffic signal upgrade? You got fifteen million dollars in there, right? Well, you plan to do it. That's a lot of money for signals. Uh, in my book, um, a lot of the engineers in the room. I see head shaking. So, you know, w what's the plan? What? Uh, and I think we ought to ask that plan before we allow or before we uh, consider. And I think this is where the board's going. Is before you take money and move money into it, what are you going to do with what you got? And uh, just a common thing. But Gene, you had your hand. I'm going to try to rephrase what I heard both of you say and tell me if I've missed the mark. We have pots of money called program funds, some of which are well-defined or maybe not so well-defined as to what the money is going to be spent on. And there is a concern about money in those pots leaking into B category projects before the A-list is done. Is that correct? Um, no, I did not get that sense. I think the, the sense that I got, because if you look at the B-list projects, these same categories are in the B-list. So that it would bring to question what, within the broad scope of one of these pro program funds, what's an A-list thing and what's in a B-list thing because they weren't defined that way in terms of specificity. Uh, like we weren't going to do the intersection of Academy and Dublin. That, is that an A? Is that an A-list intersection improvement program or B-list intersection improvement? I don't think it was down to that level. It may have been. I'm just not aware of it. I would say that if there is concerns on our part about whether or not the funding is being spent in the appropriate category, budget category is A list, B list, that we do need to have better insight into what the money is being used for and we probably shouldn't be putting more money into it until we know what's there today and how it's going to be spent and that it's going to be spent where it should be. I think, I think based on the tone, the overall tone that I heard, um, that was kind of a part of their con part of their concern. I think it's valid. Um, I don't know. Reb was at the meeting. Rick was at the meeting. Um, like I said, I I watched that. I watched the recording front to back, and I played over that middle section about the programs a, a second time, and I made notes as I went through it. and And there were some fl there were just some flat wrong statements being made by members of the board, um, and I either I attribute it to uh, a lack of understanding or a lack of knowledge. They're all smart people. I'm not calling anybody stupid by any means, but um, it, and it just happened to be that two of the three, three, three of the four main speakers in there, one, it was the first time they had been there, two, they were brand new to, the, to that board. And so that tells me that either we're missing something after being here for a long time or they're missing something in my book. So that's my personal take. Carlos. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. As you know, I sent you an email on this very question about the, um, I, I'm, I'm calling them the generic uh, program items versus the named items. Um, and I did listen to the, uh, things like everybody had a different take on that, but it, I got the impression that the board is looking to perhaps for the uh, program, the generic program items to set some sort of ceiling on it. Uh, at least that was the discussion on the Van Buren project. And the reason I had sent you the email, I was troubled that uh, we had the Van Buren project and say, like, well, we need to move on and move on to the B list. And we're not going to authorize $200,000 because, you know, it purportedly takes away from one of the named items. A few minutes later into the meeting, um, there was a transfer of $3.2 million into another vague category. And as these are their terms, uh, into the generic program items, 3.2, 16 times that amount. So it, a few minutes later, we had an, uh, I'm going to call it a, uh, an inconsistency uh, of the application. If we're thinking we're going to say, okay, we're going to put a ceiling on the generic items, but then later on saying, well, the streetscape improvements are different. And I didn't understand that. So if there's going to be exceptions to um, that ceiling, I'm certainly willing to listen to that. 
um, but I was um, I felt there was some inconsistency and in, in, in terms of what the board wants to do here it was not clear so uh, my email you know just to reiterate I'm asking that the city have an opportunity to respond I feel they were not prepared uh, to answer the specific question about the um, generic program items and how they affect the B list and I would like to see the city be able to uh, prepare some type of response and be able to come back and specifically give us that insight I think everybody is looking for and then you know if it makes sense that Sarah right we're done or complete and we need to put a ceiling on the uh, the programs uh, the generic program items uh, maybe that's the right answer per that seems where the board wants to go if it's not if we're going to continue to fund them then that's another another response and it sounds like there's a couple of different ways to do that the ballot measure itself is silent uh, on this regard it does not make a distinction between that the main programs main projects have higher or less priority any priority related to the uh, generic program so the ballot ballot initiative is silent on this matter this would be something we would have to read into and say as a matter of internal policy that we would prioritize named projects over the generic uh, programs. So that would be something that would be above and beyond the ballot measure in my opinion. And I did, that's why I want the clarification. Carlos, in response to that, you are a portion of Academy. I can define from street A to street B on Academy. If you get too, quote, careless or reckless in trying to have the, the engineers define a problem in one of those programs, you tie their hands to an extent, and then you have to go back to a ballot initiative. I am not qualified, even as an engineer, to second-guess them. They have to have flexibility. The board, on the other hand, is made up of Politicians first, second, and there might be an engineer. I doubt it, because I know them all. <laughs> anyway, my point is, I think you're, you're asking both the board and us to walk a very fine line. I, like to, I personally would rather give them the, the flexibility. On the ballot initiative, you could, got a list of, I think, 75 total projects of which at least at least 60 are defined bridge here street there those they can deal with how are you spending the money uh, there is one board member that questions constantly what is being done and how much money is being spent on West Colorado when it was put together the whole package even then they didn't have all the knowns and they didn't have all the properties even known about at the time. And that's part of the cost from overruns. But one board member is so afraid that we have fifty million dollars sitting sitting there and nobody's doing anything with it. Well these projects give the entities the flexibility to move money, not away from an A list project, but over here where it's time that they can work. I I, th I think it's more compli complex and complicated, and I'll give you the floor to Cheryl. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, it, it, as a homeowner, you know, you balance things. So for me, I'd like to know what is in the fund. The, the, we want to replace 10 stoplights or intersections. But this project, which is identified as an A project, has got overrun. So. I would like to know what I'm going to have to get rid of here in order to complete the A list. So like you said, Jim, if we had some granularity in the programs, we, we would know we're giving up this to do this. And it still gives them flexibility. It's just that you know, you ha you're, you're specifying with some general we're going to replace 10 stoplights. I'm just making that up. But we're going to have to give up these two spot, you know, stoplights in order to complete West Colorado Avenue. <laughs> if everybody makes that conscious decision to do that, that's great. I mean, that, but you have to know what you're giving up in order to know what you're getting. And so I like the granularity. Carlos? Yeah, just to kind of follow up on that. Yeah, no, I, um, as far as the, uh, the flexibility, I think that's been uh, driven home very many times by the, uh, by the city. 
What I was troubled by, particularly in this case of the Van Buren vote, is that this had received a positive recommendation from this committee of, um, I think it was like, uh, what, 12 to 2 or 13 to 2, one abstention. Um, so it received a pretty strong endorsement from this committee. It also went before the Citizens Transportation Advisory Board and also received its unanimous recommendation that this be uh, go forward as far as the city is concerned. And it went before the ATAC, had tremendous amount of public involvement. And then to uh, have the board uh, overturn that, you know, to take to go negative. I don't think I, I've been here now two years. I don't know I've ever seen a case where there's a positive recommendation from this committee to be overturned. And I think it's been brought up before. If that happens, are we doing our job? I don't feel I'm doing my job if I'm being overturned by the boss man. So that's what, in that context, I was troubled by that. That if um, they feel that it was not worthy a project to fund, then we should have felt the same way. And so I, I feel there's some inconsist inconsistency and a disconnect there. And that's the reason I would like to get some more information and factual information from the city as to how these program, generic program funds are going to be used and what the implications are on the named projects. Because that was specifically raised by the board. It was not raised here. It was not raised by this committee, but it was raised. And I felt like the city did not have an opportunity to respond to that. Um, Mike, just hold on just a second. Right. Then you can address all of them. I think so. that the itch that we're trying to scratch here is that we've had things like the Spine Road come up that should have been an A-list item that somehow got funded out of a miscellaneous category and the Sierra Madre Burma whole thing, which is coming out of other categories that's not an A-list item, but it's, it's an A-list item. I think that's what's bothering. That's when you're starting to see these eight, seven votes and stuff like that of this committee is because we're feeling this just doesn't right the way it's being worked. Okay, Mike, uh, you were there and you had the you had the bullseye on your chest. So, um, uh, no, I. That, so basically, uh, we can get you a list of what we're doing with these, especially with the traffic programs, and it's quite a, a large list of of needs that we didn't know, you know, they kind of come up. And that's the purpose of these program, fa program funds is as a need comes up, we have money to address them. I, th I understand your concern. I think uh, of all the overruns on the programs, if you look at roadway and safety traffic operations, that's probably the largest one. That's the one where I think has been doubled. Uh, the simple answer there is seven million went to Cimarron I-25 interchange. That was not, we weren't anticipating using that fund back when we made it. So that one I can, you know, easily explain why it's so much larger is because seven million went to, to the CDOT project. And that was a, you know, some, you know, the board was, you know, somebody made a case and, and the board approved that. Um, I think I've said a, a few times that if we're going to come up with something that's a stretch from what you know people kind of think these programs are going to use we're going to come talk to you before we spring it on you um, so uh, you know things like the spine road we'll discuss um, and uh, but we but bottom line is we, we can give you a, uh, we can come with the report that shows what we've done with these projects and where the money's going one of the things I want to reiterate again I keep hearing the term what a-list projects are we sacrificing for the programs were not. I've shown and I've, I've you know, I try to explain even continuing to fund those programs with their yearly allotments that, that we've been giving them we still look at that we're I'm still looking that we can finish the A-list and have some you know some reserve there so we're not giving anything up. Um, case in point um, the Greenway Trail uh, that's, that's a trail program originally there was Two point one million dollars shown as as a target, and then we started using that to uh, fund the uh, America Beautiful Bridge to the tune of well three point five, and then another million. What I have been doing because I, I you know the budget allows and we you know we've been able to do this is I have still been trying to make sure Parks gets two point one for the Greenway Trail elsewhere, and that's why if you look at that budget. It's actually, uh, it's you know, it's I'm, uh, you know, it's law, it's expanded because we, we we put money to the bridge, but I'm also trying to, you know, uh, let parks have 2.1 to go do what they originally wanted to, 
Now, if you know, if, if we want to put a ceiling on all those programs, <coughs> the board decides that, that that's fine. But that's kind of another reason why they continue to grow is because I've tried to make sure that that the original funding that was identified goes to the appropriate department to do what they they originally were. I think, though, uh, yeah. Mike, I think we've been graced by a flourishing economy that's had us not cause harm to the A-list items, mm -hmm. and we cannot count on that. And and had we not been doing some of these other things, we may have been further on, further deeper into the A-list that we already had, mm -hmm. and then working closer to getting into the B-list, as opposed to we're, we've got we've got plentiful income right now, which is a wonderful thing. But we could have the Great Recession Part Two show up next year, mm -hmm. and then we're screwed. Yeah, and again, uh, my projections are based on a little bit lower projections than right. what we've been using because I understand that things could slow down. Uh, so my plan, I think, if there's a little bit of slowdown, we're good. If we have a great recession, well, they, you know, I don't know if the money we would have spent on the programs would have made a difference anyway. Uh, one, another point, you know, everyone's worried about this B list. Well, we are working to replace the Platte Avenue bridges over Sand Creek. We're doing both bridges. Originally, one direction, one you know, the westbound or whatever eastbound was identified as an RTA one list, and the other side was listed as a B list project. Well, we went out and got a federal grant. We're doing both sides under the A you know A list program um, with federal funding and RTA funding. So we actually are, and uh, there's a couple other B list projects that we're getting done with all other funds. So it's not like you know, or I guess you know the concern about the B list is. Is a, you know I understand that, but we're actually getting some of them done through other various methods. Um, RTA one, there was a C list that we we never got. We actually end up doing most of those with other funds. Um, so so you know we're we're watching both A and B list. We're we're you know we understand that there's an expectation, but bottom line is we'll get you a report to show you kind of where how those. Uh, program funds have been used and and I think you'll be surprised that it's done quite a bit of work and then what else we have uh, in the future for those thank you I, I think that would I think that would benefit us and um, I think it would provide an opportunity for the members of the board to become a little more informed uh, about those projects um, and that's is a good thing it we're going to live with the decisions they make um, but I think making an informed decision versus one that's based off either incomplete or false information is, is not to the benefit of the citizens, in, in my opinion. So, uh, Okay. Thanks, Mike. Jim. Yes. Sorry. Um, I just totally concur with what you say. Um, we, we need that information. We know that we may be overturned and are overturned, but we still need to be able to make reasonable, intelligent decisions by having the proper information before us. So I thank you for what you've been doing on this effort. Okay. Um, okay, any other discussion on that? All right, thank you. Uh, I-25 Powers Interchange update. Hoo-hoo, here we go. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is John Leo Satos. I'm the transportation director for the uh, PPACG. Uh, so the reason why I'm here, well, which I ask myself that often, but uh, Rick uh, <laughs> actually asked me to be here today and see if I can do this in less than three minutes, so I'll do my best. But uh, at the uh, April PPACG board meeting, we had a tip amendment item uh, where we talked about the powers extension and some of the funding that w was uh, uh, being moved on to the project. I believe a member of this committee happened to see that presentation and asked for the uh, sort of that presentation to be given again. So I will try to take that presentation and condense it down and, and give it back to you. Uh, but the one thing that I really want to highlight is, again, what I can focus on uh, being uh, a staff member of the PBACG is that TIP process, why we uh, talked about it, uh, what the action we took actually in fact did. If there are uh, additional 
um, items that you want to chat about beyond my scope of knowledge, which would not by any stretch of the imagination be too difficult to get to, um, we'd probably want to, again, schedule something in the future for you all to have someone from CDOT come and, and, give, and, and chat with you. Uh, but I would warn you that it is a very nuanced project uh, with a lot of different agreements in place. So you're going to want to make sure you, you, you uh, schedule at least probably 25 minutes to, to a half hour for it. Um, but we'll see if, if, if I can uh, scratch the itch, so to speak, and, and hopefully answer uh, uh, some of the questions. So uh, by way of background, because this particular project, again, it's uh, uh, brought forward by the developer, I believe it's the Copper Ridge, yeah, the Copper Ridge uh, uh, in, Improvement uh, met, metro, metro District, excuse me, it's not Improvement District here, the Metro Districts here, um, uh, that they're going to connect uh, powers to 25. This particular phase, phase one, is Voyager, which you can see on the, the south part of this uh, map, uh, to I-25. Uh, this particular project, again, um, is using Metro District funds uh, that were approved by the City of Colorado Springs, I believe a tax increase uh, for about $56 million, I believe, uh, for the bulk of the project, and uh, another, sorry, I think it was three... Oh, excuse me, uh, uh, $6.2 million um, in drainage funds for the drainage project, uh, which you can see from a little bit of uh, that map here. Again, it's the map that we were given uh, would take care of that. And again, that's a metro district project. But again, by way of background, the reason why PPACG is involved is because I-25 is a federal facility. You can't do any work on a federal facility unless uh, those funds in that project appear in the Regional Long Range Plan and the Regional Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP. So even though this particular amendment was using uh, drainage funds as well as the uh, Metro District funds, no PPACG funds were part of this TIP amendment, it's still by federal process to get the, the federally required access permits had to come through the PPACG process. So um, we received the letter from CDOT. CDOT, again, acts as the, the, the agent on behalf of the feds, because the feds really don't do a lot of stuff by themselves. They invest, they divest, rather, those uh, uh, authorities to the state in which the facility sits. So in this particular case, uh, Colorado Department of Transportation. So, Colorado, so CDOT is acting as the agent for, for the feds. That's why they're involved. Uh, Colorado Springs is involved um, because, again, it's within their jurisdictional boundaries, uh, and again, their uh, approval of the metro district taxes, which are going to uh, uh, generate the uh, revenue to pay off the bonds to do the project. And of course, then you have the actual metro district that's doing the work. So again, we had the 6.2 million of the TIP amendment to do the drainage improvements, and then we had uh, the 52.3 million uh, for the work itself, which is uh, which again is that connection between Voyager and I-25, not that phase two, which would be the rest of the project. And so that was the TIP amendment that came forward to uh, the Board of Directors. Board of Directors approved that. Again, that happened back in April. Um, Rick was actually trying to get me to come and visit you here last month. However, you had a pretty full agenda, so that's why I'm, I'm here today. So that's, in a nutshell, what the action was, why we took it, why we were involved. Uh, but that being said, to the extent I was given any additional background information, I'm, I'm happy to try to answer any questions or, again, uh, take your input for what you'd like to see in the future. I have a question. So this contractor is doing this, right? The, uh, the, the, the Metro District. The Metro District. Yep. $50 million. I count six bridges, two of them over, four of them over an interstate, and a tunnel I'm assuming they're going to take powers under Highway 83, not over it, uh, at the southern terminus there. Oh, that's right. We're talking we're, to Voyager. We're just starting at Voyager. This, from Voyager okay. to there. So that's about a mile, maybe. I, I am. I but I count four you're... bridges over the interstate for 50 million bucks. I don't see how that's. I don't think I'd say that's possible, because the the southbound exit would be a bridge the way that's depicted there crossing off of there um, that's um, going south, going on to Powers, 
is more than likely a bridge. It looks like the way that's drawn. And you've got across the northbound lanes of each of that. Um, so I count them at four bridges there and uh, uh, all the construction of two lanes and this, that, and another for $50 million, I don't, I don't see. I mean, put it in a tip, I agree, um, but I don't see. Somebody's Let's smoking see. the wrong pipe. Well, again, it, <laughs> and, and the action was that was the, um, the amount that was being amended into the tip was the 52. Uh, so okay. the total project cost, let me see if uh, I've got that here. But while I'm trying to find the rotate button, you were at the meeting. Can you help me out? Help me out. Somebody help me out here, please. Sir, as far as I know, they have not designed the connection to 25. They've got an issue with the Federal Highway Administration's requirements that there be so much distance between an egress between access. Between bridges. No, Michael. No. No. The... Speaking of my oh, it's my understanding that has not been finalized how you're going to get off of uh, whatever they're going to, it's supposed to be Powers, but in regards to who funds it, the road that comes from Powers and finally connects to the interstate, they have it figured out that they're getting CDOT money from, uh, see, Highway 83 uh, to the, and going west to the interstate is already a good portion of it is CDOT property or they have right away. But they do not have a final design or acceptance of a final design of any sort to make the connection actually to the interstate because they're going through hoops trying to meet the federal requirements of <coughs> where he comes on the highway and I get off can't be too close together. That's right. His, yeah. Okay, so I, I, I so it wasn't it wasn't a fifty million project. It was only an amendment of fifty million. Well, and, and mm -hmm. but it looks like their budget that they gave us was sixty two point six million. So that's, to your question, is that enough? No, that's no. you know that's. But that sixty two is six million waste and fifty six from the developers, Copper Ridge. Uh, I'm sorry, not the the whatever. So right. the, the pump, group. The, the published schedule on this was bond sales in November and break ground in the first quarter of next year. So that doesn't jive very well with not having even gotten Fed approval yet for uh, for the interchange. <laughs> Jennifer Irvin, County Engineer, and I just know this as a result of uh, some other things that have been going on. Um, the, the, the project is actually designed for this first phase. It's actually out to bid right now. Um, so I, I think that that does jive with it. I think uh, the next phase isn't fully designed. I think CDOT has a 30% design on that. Does this first phase, does it include the actual entry and en exit to the highway, I-25? So I am not the expert on this by any means. It just uh, well, Jim's I, got a valid point, though. Yeah, I, they, I, my understanding is that this has been designed. Okay. They've gone through the environmental process at CDOT, right. and it's out to bid today. Um, that's that's how just, they came up with the amount of money for the. I, I the can't water speak to the money. I just can things. speak to the point that I was copied on uh, that this was going out to bid. All right. So the, the west end, which is phase one. Yes. Okay. No. I, uh, that map, I can't really see. Where is this? <laughs> Seriously? Highway 83 no, flowers no, no, no. go No, 83 there. is way off the map. All right, one of the only from Voyager. So this is Voyager, this is the uh, Bass Pro Shop, and this is I-25. Okay. Okay, so... The top is... So it would be remaking Northgate? Oh, oh south so of Northgate. Voyager and then south of Northgate. Right. North, south, so east, right. west. So it, it, the initial tie-in is right at at Northgate, and then the the southbound connection is south of Northgate. So at the bottom, that's Voyager. Because here's the traffic circles. You can barely see them. Oh, there's the circle. That's okay. Northgate right there. Yeah. And at the at the the bottom, that's Voyager. So yes, the, there's a bridge. 
So again, I think this goes back to my original statement. I'll try to be less than five minutes. However, it's a complicated thing. And we're way past that five minutes at this point. So again, if you want to bring someone in from CDOT and, and schedule a good half hour, that might be that. Or leave it for something for if there are folks that are interested, invite someone from CDOT to show up uh, uh, a half hour before the meeting starts, uh, however you want to do it. But I, I don't have an RTA sign hanging out there, promises kept. I'm <laughs> no, I don't, I don't believe so. As far as it's RTA funding for any of this. It's not a PPRTA it, project. It's a B list yeah. project. It is? Yes. Towers from 83 to I 25 is a B list project. It is a B list, yes. But there is no, R no uh, PPRTA funds in, that in this particular project. Right. So. But the, the With that, my understanding is that 83 to I-25 was actually further south the, was the original design that they were talking about. Now, I, when I say design conceptual, um, this seems to be further north, so I'm wondering how they're going to make that connection. It's supposed to go right through the middle of Flying Yes. Yeah, the the right-of-way through the middle of Flying Horse exists. So okay, it's, it. it's, it's it, still it there. It has a sign on it. So. Yeah. Future right away. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We don't need to kill kill a whole bunch of brain cells on this, but thanks for the update on this. Um, it's, it's it's another example of just of us being informed and the general public not knowing what projects what that we can keep everybody straight and keep that. Oh, you want the? Can we take you up on your offer though, as far as CDOT's coming down and spending thirty to forty minutes? Just are you, you can take up me up on my offer of me inviting CDOT, and I'll buy them lunch beforehand, too. But I can't guarantee that CDOT will do it. But I, I'm pretty sure that they'd be happy to do it. We'll ask John Hall to, to come by. But again, whether that's something on your agenda, I'm not sure that that's, again, since it's not a PPRTA project at this point. That being said, if you're interested in it, I'm pretty sure CDOT would be happy to share any information, and we can set up something right before your meeting, however you want to do it. It is a big deal. Yes. Uh, uh, I've got the sketches of all of the whole segment. I'll send them to you. They're all in color. It, it depends on what you want. It's, it's nice. not current. It's not an A list project. It's a B list project that will probably be done before you get to in 2023 or 2024. Uh, if you want to spend a half hour now on something that's going to be 2024, that's fine. It's up to you. Show of hands, anybody interested? If you're interested, raise your hand. I'd like to see it forwarded from Tom. Okay. Uh, yeah, the we'll, Tom small group? We'll, we'll see what information Tom has and go from there. How's that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for Thank your time. Thanks Appreciate for the info. Thank you, sir. Uh, HC, House Bill 1258. This is a referral from the board to the CAC asking for the CAC's input. Uh, the House Bill 19-1258 did pass uh, the legislature and was, was signed by the governor. It <clears throat> sets a ballot measure for November to ask the uh, it's statewide, to ask the statewide voters if they want to um, have a taper cap um, exception for state revenue over the, the Tabor uh, limit each year and for that uh, revenue in excess of the Tabor limit each year to, to go one-third each to public schools, higher ed, and roads and bridges. So the, that uh, measure will be on the November ballot. So the question is, does the CAC want to recommend to the board that the board take a public position in favor, against, or no position regarding this November ballot measure. Okay, um, Larry, then Tony. No, um, I'm sorry. Rick, I just read in the paper this morning that they are possibly uh, pushing a special session of the legislature to revise that particular ballot issue. I think that's uh, a different one. I, I, I read it as, tw unless it's a typo, I read, read that as 1257. Um, um, now, there, as I understand it, there are two actual uh, 
issues, I guess you might say, is that there's one ballot issue which would take the cap off of Tabor completely. But what they were discussing in the paper this morning is the special session which would actually limit that to 10 years, yeah. which then would have an effect upon the um, proportions that they were talking about. So I, I could run upstairs or I could ask Jessica to run upstairs and grab the Gazette off the kitchen table to, to see. Bev, would you be willing to get the Gazette uh, from upstairs? Just because it's in the Gazette doesn't mean it's accurate. Well, <laughs> <laughs> true statement. Very true spoken. Uh, so I think that's a, I think if the if I remember correctly and if it wasn't a typo in the Gazette, I think that's a different ballot measure. Where's Mr. Anshin? All right, Tony. So on this uh, particular proposal, I, I see two problems with it. Uh, first of all, since we're going to be talking about whether we want to support or oppose, right? Um, one problem is it, it takes a lot of the bite out of Tabor if, if uh, you know, we run over, uh, well, you just keep the money anyway. So then why, uh, why have the limitation in the first place? So uh, um, I, I believe that the limitation on Tabor mm -hmm. is a good thing, and if they want to keep the money, they should have to come back to us each time. I understand that costs money, but that's what Tabor is there to do. Number two, really, if, we're, if this passes, basically what we're saying is they can take all our extra money and you know, give it to Denver. Because let, let's be honest, that's where almost all that money is going to be spent, Denver, Boulder, and we're going to see very little of it come down back down to Colorado Springs, as is the case with many of the uh, state programs. So, Well, well to add to that and then go to Tom, uh, I'm working my okay. way around. Uh, to add to that, um, it's not RTA money, so it wouldn't come to us anyway. It would go to PPACG for their planning. Yeah, so. so my concern in reading the bill is that there is nothing in here preventing the state legislators, otherwise known as the robbers, <coughs> to take the money that they currently put into highways and getting rid of that and replacing it with this, and we end up with nothing more than we have today. There is no guarantee that, that they can't do that. Unhop. It's the same thing they did with the billion dollars for schools back a while ago, and then they just took the money they used to give it, and, and the schools weren't any further ahead. So. Well, and that's another issue, too, uh, Tom, is that from what I've read is that this proportion that they have in this bill does not preclude them from passing it this year with, you know, one-third, one-third, and then next year doing another bill and taking out the highway or the schools or whatever completely um, to where this bill is invalid as far as what they're proposing. Okay, Gene. I mean, Brian. Um, so far, everybody seems to be on, on pretty much the same page. But the the things that I see are number one, this is permanently. Number two, we know why this is being done. It's being done to circumvent Tabor, to weaken Tabor, and to essentially remove citizen um, control of fiscal responsibility at the state level. Um, the, the, and they're doing it surreptitiously, as they always do, by using emotional subjects like public education and higher education. Hey, yeah, um, th it's it's a very bad. Now, I think we do have a place to say something on this because roads and bridges and transportation is specifically mentioned in it. So I think it would be a good thing for us to recommend um, not only monitoring, but I would actually recommend that we recommend to the board that they take a public position to oppose this vehemently. Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, John. I'll come right back to you. That's fine. So my concern is um, that if, if voters were to pass this, they would feel like, hey, we've funded transportation, and then when a real transportation bill comes on the ballot down the line, they will turn it down like they did last year because they feel like, oh, we just passed this. What more do we need? So that's why I would agree with opposing it. Good point. Joan? Yeah. Um, this is opening up Pandora's box. And um, we've seen it happen too often in the legislature where they claim they're going to spend money on A, B, and C 
and then somehow it goes to D, E, and F, and A, B, and C is out the window. Therefore, my level of comfort and trust with the legislature <laughs> is such that I would like to see the board oppose this measure. Okay. Um, we don't need to make a... I would like to make a motion. Oh. Yeah, uh, that is my motion that the uh, board oppose House Bill 19-1258. Second. Yeah, we all second that. Larry, was there any, any addition? Was it the right one, wrong one? Yeah, I'd just um, like to say yeah. one thing, Jim, is that, you know, with what uh, Rick brought in, is that there's actually two bills that they passed uh, relative to this particular issue. Uh, first one was 1257, which refers the to the ballot uh, proposition CC, which does away with the cap on Tabor. Now that's the one that they're talking about now of having a special session right. to you know look at instead of it being forever, because they found out that so many people, including all of us, said, wait a minute, you know, we don't want to give up our refunds forever. Uh, so they're looking at changing that to, um, you know, 10 years. But then in relationship to that, they also passed and approved 1258, which appropriates the money that supposedly would come from Proposition CC. And this is where, this is just in statute. You know, CC is actually in the Constitution. But this one is the one where they can actually, you know, pass it with the three breakouts next year, repeal this, change it, take higher education funding out or transportation or whatever. So I'm in agreement that we should oppose this because if they really want to do this correctly, they should have these three breakouts as part of that CC proposition, in my own opinion. Okay. Well, All right. John? And yeah. to piggyback on that, um, I'm going to go back to Pandora's box. Um, you know, 10 years today, but who knows what they'll change it and do. And I'm sorry if I sound very... Um, Negative. Hmm. Um, I don't trust. Them however, <laughs> it's just been my experience as a citizen and uh, also as a political activist that somehow the dollars never get below Douglas County, and I'm rather tired of our money going north, nothing coming south. And we are treated like the um, bad stepchildren because we are conservative El Paso County and we don't play the same political games that the greater Denver area plays, in my less than humble opinion. Thank you. All right. Rev, you had something you want to say? I, I'd like to revise the motion when I say your motion. And the purpose is, I've listened to the board every time they get asked, and they play with it. Generally speaking, they will take a positive or negative recommendation, anything like this, and word it the way they want. And basically, even though we recommend it, they word it, not us. So, is that right, right? Generally? Okay, so we have a motion on the floor to make a recommendation to the board that they do not support House Bill 1258. Is that summarized properly? I actually think the emotion was to oppose that we recommend Opp opposition. Because right. there's, there's... Affirmative opposition. Yeah. yeah. I just want to make that clear because there are yeah. there's a little bit of a semantic difference. Gene? It's already been covered. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we have a question. We have a motion and a second. Um, so all in favor, oh, Carl, sorry. 
Uh, yeah, the motion that's on the floor right now is to oppose uh, the House bill. It's already law. It's already passed. You can oppose all you want. It's already been signed. I would like to uh, make a motion to amend that it's referendum CC that we go on the record to oppose, just to modify it so it's clear that it's the ballot measure before the voters, not the House bill itself. So it would be a clarification, I think, right? Yeah, it, it's it, what's going before the voters is Proposition CC that's asking for the um, a permanent override of the Tabor, a debrucing measure. So I'd like to amend the uh, motion that's in pending to strike the words uh, the House Bill, what is it, 1258 or 1257 uh, with referendum CC. I am willing to uh, make that correction as noted. Thank you. That was my error. Okay. Who made the second? Gene. Gene, are you okay with that too? Okay. Okay. Is that, uh, all, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. I-25 hey, got kind of nice. <laughs> okay, the memo in your packet on the uh, I-25 gap contribution funding plan, um, that the next step is that uh, uh, Beverly would cut a check for $3.614,141 million for CDOT, which will be done next Tuesday, and uh, as soon as the board uh, does the mid-year budget amendment on uh, July 10, then uh, the board chair and vice chair will sign that check and will ha either hand it to a CDOT person if they're in the audience or stick it in the mail. All right, very good. Put it in the mail. 80. <laughs> yeah. Miss, miss, it a, miss address it so it takes a week or two weeks. I might yeah. never get there with today's mail service. Uh, definitions of projects and capital maintenance, Rick. Um, I developed a uh, list of uh, uh, what I felt were capital and maintenance projects and submitted them to city staff. We met yesterday. We uh, refined the list, and uh, we, we think we have something that the CAC and board might uh, like to review and potentially approve as a new board policy. Uh, that will give guidance uh, on what's capital and what's maintenance. So we'll have that in your, uh, on your agenda for next month. Okay. Good. Um, next one, whatever. Uh, I see. Oh, gap, gap project <clears throat> update. Uh, no real change from last month. And my request to the CAC is, uh, since there haven't been many changes in this last few months, is to only submit it to you when there's significant change and not have it on the agenda every month uh, with no change. I think that is an excellent idea. There's there's no point in just telling us that there's nothing new. You know, when we've got something, let's hear it. Very good. I concur. Yep. Okay, item nine, agenda topics for next meeting. Yeah, yeah. the maintenance thing he's yeah. going to do. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, very good. Thank you. Um, communications, anybody have anything, uh, Brian? Oh, Jean, go ahead. Um, my understanding is is that uh, the legislature passed a bill or they are, no, I'm sorry, that's not correct. There is an initiative out that is going to recommend repeal of Tabor. It's gone through a court process regarding the single ballot issue uh, requirement of the Constitution. Whoever is pushing the uh, attempt to repeal Tabor is now in the process of starting or beginning to collect signatures to petition this onto the ballot. I suspect that we need to keep an eye on it and pay attention to what's going on because the board, I'm pretty certain, will ask for input from, from us yeah, if it hits the ballot. Okay. I think, didn't the state Supreme Court rule that this did not violate the, That's the single, single That's subject? That's correct. Um, that is so. correct. Although the, the exact wording of the ballot initiative is still being worked, the basic tenet that it doesn't violate the single, uh, single subject rule, single subject rule uh, it didn't violate it. Right. Okay. Um, Ann? Did mine? 
Uh, I'd just like to say Green Mountain Falls is still looking for a town manager. Oh. They, okay. they have not hired anybody yet. And, um, <laughs> okay. What'd you say? He, Rev, Rev wants it, but he's not applying. Oh, he's not applying. <laughs> right, Brian? Um, Joan, if you want to go. I just wanted to say to end up on a happy note, a happy 4th of July to everyone. Have a safe and wonderful holiday. Do not light illegal fireworks um, in El Paso County. Thank you very much. Hang your Betsy Ross flag. And hang your Betsy Ross flag. <laughs> so if I could, um, and thanks, uh, I wanted to beg your indulgence for just a couple of minutes to bring you guys up to date. As you know, I'm uh, involved with the El Paso County Homeless Veterans Coalition. Uh, I held a ride on the 19th of May, as I've done for the last 12 years. Uh, we were fortunate enough to generate $8,500 that we were able to give to the Homeless Vets Coalition uh, for this year. And the Homeless Vets Coalition uh, also received a federal, or well, federal state together grant um, again this year, which will allow us to um, assist more veterans. Um, I think I told you guys a story uh, a couple months back about a Vietnam era veteran uh, who needed a kidney transplant. Uh, kidney transplant and uh, to basically save his life and we had a um, Gulf War veteran who was a perfect match who was willing to do it however he would have to be out of work for two months and would not be able to pay his bills we did that for him as a result both men are doing awesome Good. Um, so yeah it's um, uh, we we've, we've done a lot to uh, so just since last year, the, uh, we instituted our homeless prevention program to try and, and catch these family units before they uh, become homeless. Um, and our annual stand down, I have flyers if you're interested uh, in getting the word out. Um, the annual, our 21st annual stand down event for homeless vets at uh, the auditorium is going to be October 15th, Tuesday. Um, and so, yeah, anybody who can uh, help get the word out. Um, you can go to the website, um, or you can go to the Facebook page, or um, just spread the word around to you know, various people that you're in touch with. Um, but yeah, it's 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 kind of a nice thing. I, f I figured the day before Independence Day was a good story. So, thanks. Any communication from anybody else? All right, we're adjourned. Thanks. Thanks for everybody. Have a great, safe Fourth of July. Uh, Celebrate independence. Yeah, there we go.